podcasting from the Star Group, home of the iconic Dressable Lions. This is Beyond the Known, the podcast that takes you a step beyond what you know about business. I'm your host, Paul M. Newberger, president of the Star Group. On today's episode of Beyond the Known, our guest is Kyle Stevens, VP of Finance and Administration at Good City Brewing. Among others, Kyle is responsible for accounting and finance, human resources, facilities, and office administration. Kyle, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. That's a lot of hats on your head. I'm assuming there's no dull moment at the office for you. Yeah, you could add a few other things to that. You know, pallet jack, pallet mover, forklift driver every now and then. There's a few other things I do around the place. Beer tester. Of course. I wouldn't have taken the job if not. I assume so. So Kyle, I have to imagine that a kid doesn't just wake up one morning and say, you know what? I want to be involved in fund formation and capital raising. I know you love numbers. I know you've had a career as a CPA. When did you start to see that shift where you found this passion for these items and really started to find that to be an alluring career choice? Well, after, you know, the professional football player and basketball player phase of my childhood, I always wanted to be an attorney. I went to college and took some prerequisites to going to law school, philosophy, English, you know, those types of classes. I, I realized I didn't really like reading and writing papers a whole lot. So attorney kind of fell off from there. I decided to take some business classes and kind of stumbled into accounting. Had a really good professor at UWM, Chuck Conkle, and I found out I was really, you know, pretty good at accounting and, you know, the easy math involved and everybody else hated it. So I thought, hey, this is a good opportunity. If everybody else hates it, there's probably jobs out there, so I'll do it. But also growing up, my family had a small manufacturing business and, you know, just, you know, talking to my grandpa and my dad and my uncles, I always had a passion for business, but I never knew what I wanted to do inside of it. And then I realized everybody needs an accountant. So, you know, whether I wanted to get into government, into small business, publicly owned companies, or even tax prep, I could do it. So what kind of impact did the family owned small business have on you? The general impact is how hard my family worked. <laughs> you know, family wasn't really around a whole lot. They were growing a business. What they did was check plastic injection molding. In the 90s, all General Motors gas caps for the most part were made by my family's company. So they were busy, you know, they were traveling the country. My dad and my grandpa were both private pilots. They would fly themselves to sales meetings, which was pretty cool. So when I got to see him, my dad and my grandpa, you know, we cherished the time, but definitely some good mentors, probably more in a adult sense. I don't know if I, I took a ton as a child because my mom spent most of the time with us, my sister and I, but definitely now I look back and I kind of see the teachings, you know, making more of an effect on my life today. So you referenced those teachings and the impact that they had on your life. What specifically were those teachings? What did you learn about entrepreneurship? What did you learn about business from the influence that uh, your family had on you? The biggest thing is, is in a lot of cases today, education matters just to kind of get your foot in the door. But, you know, throughout my whole life, I just, you know, still ringing my ears today is my grandpa, you know, if you don't work hard, somebody out there will work harder than you. So kind of taking that to, to work with me every day. If somebody, if nobody's going to do it, I'm going to do it. So that goes back to all those hats that I wear is, you know, if the business can afford to bring somebody on to help out with certain jobs, that's great. I'm going to do what's, you know, at my highest value, but, you know, like looking into the industry today and kind of how a lot of businesses are decimated, a lot of managers remain, but a lot of, you know, everyday, you know, staff that do the dirty work for the most part, um, a lot of them aren't around right now. And you just got to step in there and finish it up and get it done. Now you mentioned some of the mentors that you've had in your life. I know in preparation for our program, you mentioned mentors several times. It seems like you've been very blessed and fortunate to have several mentors outside of family. Who else has served in a mentorship capacity for you? Yeah. I mean, really just starting in college, I mentioned uh, Chuck Conkle. He wasn't a direct mentor, but I definitely took his teachings to heart every day, kind of having fun with your career, but still working hard. From there, I actually got my first internship via volunteer intern or my first paid internship as a volunteer intern at Community Shares of Greater Milwaukee. So I got to know their finance committee and one of them worked at a 
CPA firm in town. And she ended up recruiting me uh, to the CPA firm. So before I was done with college, I had a short stint as a paid intern and then had a full-time job offer before I even graduated. So from there, I learned the importance of uh, giving back to the community, mentoring, or, uh, mentoring and networking and how important those things are and really how that can get you from point A to point B, even if you just need help with uh, something every day. Hey, I know somebody who might know that, you know, Paul, you know, if I need have a question about insurance, I know I can call you and you'll get me in touch with somebody on your team that can help me. Right. So it's important to know, know people in all facets of life. Yeah, absolutely. It's like what they say. It's not so much what you know, it's who you know, and you certainly seem to be an embodiment of that. You alluded to the fact that you have served as a mentor for others. Do you do that in a formal capacity or is that just at kind of an, on an as needed basis as you meet people moving forward? Yeah. So it started informally, I think, through just supervising and managing staff in CPA firms and accounting firms. And, you know, it, it's been really fulfilling to see them grow as professionals. You know, they've moved on and now I have people that worked with me and for me that are now controllers at, you know, public companies or large private organizations. And then I took the next step a couple of years ago. I've always been involved with UWM and the alumni association there, and they've got a couple of different programs. So I got involved with Multicultural Mentoring Program, which is for first generation and minority students. So that's a formal program through the school, kind of set out guidelines, how often you meet, what you talk about. If the students don't have questions, you know, they push the mentors to, you know, tell them stories or help give them insight on how they got where they are. And then secondarily, the UWM Alumni Association set up new mentoring program this year for graduates, 2020 graduates coming out of college this year during coronavirus. So that was really interesting to learn what it's like to be someone with no experience, no professional experience uh, coming into a market. Fortunately, my mentee has a job at U.S. Bank and, you know, outside of his training being with one other person in a 1,000 person office that's empty right now, it seems like it's kind of, you know, he started his career seamlessly He's still employed, but that's certainly not the case for everybody else out there. So we talked about your love of numbers and how you fell into a passion with respect to being a CPA. I understand that you can use that passion and skill set in your role today. I guess my question is, how did Good City Brewing lure you away from being a CPA? And was that a difficult move for you to make professionally? At the time, I think it was difficult. I'll take you all the way back. So Dan Cott is our CEO. I met Dan uh, while working at my first job out of college uh, at Scribner Cohn and Company. He worked on a project for Saz's Catering. Are you guys familiar with Saz's, like from the festivals and they've got a restaurant down on State Street. So he re redeveloped Saz's Catering Facility in Walker's Point. Uh, at the time, Saz was my client. So I met with Dan, you know, talking about the project and we just got to know each other, stayed in touch. Uh, he was doing commercial real estate development at the time, so he's always working on projects. Uh, several years later, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm opening a brewery on the east side. And I was like, cool, I live downtown. So my wife and I became very good customers, uh, the food and drink uh, at Good City. And I think it was about uh, two years, a uh, year and a half in to uh, Good City's tenure that uh, they found out that they were gonna open a new location downtown. It wasn't public yet, but they were going to be in Deer District next to Pfizer Forum. So he said, Kyle, we really need to get organized because we're just an entrepreneurial startup and we really don't know what's going on administratively. You know, we're probably going to have close to 100 employees in a couple of years. We need somebody to get it organized. And he asked me if I knew any accountants. And I was like, well, what about me? Like, well, we can't afford you. So we'll f maybe we can figure it out. So yeah, that's kind of how we stepped into it. I think at the time I was working on a project for Grant Thornton. I was working on an acquisition project with Grant Thornton in South Line, Michigan. So at the time I was flying around the country every week to different places, really didn't get to see my wife. And, you know, coming back home to Milwaukee and working with a small company, helping them grow was really attractive. So what's it like to work in the hospitality industry, especially for individuals that might not be familiar with that side of the house. We know we like to go there to eat, to drink, to be merry and social, but what's it like to be a professional in that industry? I think it's hard because I think there's a certain perception when most of the staff is service industry staff, but 
I try not to hold this over there and I really don't tell anybody, but I worked in a restaurant the whole time I was in college. And I think it's important for maybe everybody to do it for at least a summer. Cause if you go to restaurants, which most, most if not all people do, uh, you just kind of realize what people are going through. It's a tough job, whether it's dealing with everybody and social interactions, or if it's being in a hot kitchen for 10 hours a day. So in that way, I think I can level a little bit, but it's tough, especially originally we were in an office, probably a eight by 10 foot office with four people at the brewery. So it wasn't, you know, it was pretty cramped, but now we've got our own office, but on the Northwest side of Milwaukee and it's nice. We've got plenty of space for all of our office staff, but that comes with its own challenges. You know, you're a little separated from the day-to-day operations you've really got to nail your communication with your staff so they know what's going on throughout the business. Otherwise it seems like, oh, you've got, you know, management or the office staff over here. We've got kitchen employees over here. We've got brewery employees over here and nobody talks. So communications really become key. So this is going to be the biggest understatement of all understatements, but obviously the COVID-19 pandemic was very disruptive in our personal lives, for our health, for business, from an economic perspective. I think of all the industries that were disrupted due to this pandemic, arguably hospitality took it on the chin more than others. So either you personally, Kyle, or from a good city brewing perspective, what was the biggest lesson that you learned as you endured this disruption from COVID-19? Never be comfortable. I don't know. It's You can write all the plans that you want, but during a pandemic like this that none of us have been through, it's going to get ripped up every week and rewritten, which is probably the most difficult part with a small team. And, you know, just trying to make plans to get all your people back. Uh, it's probably the biggest thing for us, but, you know, it's just ebbs and flows and we, we got to go with it. We got to try to keep people happy. You got to try to keep yourself happy, but you can't stop grinding <laughs> is the big thing. So let's say you were asked to teach a class and Obviously, you're in a leadership position right now with Good City Brewing, and you've got some other current leaders or prospective leaders as your pupils. If you had to pick two leadership lessons that you learned or that you wish others would learn as a result of the disruption from COVID-19, what would you teach them? What lessons do you think other leaders should take from this experience? Marry someone with a master's in public health, which I fortunately did. So I have some insight as to what's going on and how to intertwine, you know, what you're hearing from the CDC, what you're hearing from local health departments and stuff like that. So I'm fortunate in that way, but really you just, it kind of goes back to basketball. I always, you know, we talk about the pivot foot and you just got to be willing to pivot. You got to be ready. You can't sit in, in a spot and, and not move, especially today. We've got global pandemic. We've got social uprising and, you know, it's a good social uprising that people are talking about and we need to continue that, but you got to pivot. And then you also have to know like when you keep your line, we've been doing a lot of stuff that we're really proud of at good city. A lot of it takes financial resources to do a lot of those good things. So we've stepped back when we don't have the financial resources and we ask ourselves, you know, what, what can we continue to do with limited resources? Uh, And we got to keep doing them. Now, you're a man of passion, Kyle. There's a number of things that you're passionate about. There's a number of things that it appears you get excited to get out of bed and start your day about. One of the passions that you are vocal around is your passion for restoring manufacturing and the labor force in Milwaukee. What exactly does that mean and where does that passion come from? What I think that means is we've got a an office and warehouse at Century City One, which is in the 30th Street Industrial Corridor, arguably one of the greatest manufacturing corridors historically in the United States. Where we sit right now, it's a former site of A.O. Smith and Tower Automotive. They probably employed tens of thousands of people at one point there on 31st and Capitol. And they just left very quickly in the 90s. So we've seen a lot of issues arising in the inner city of Milwaukee because of that. We're involved with an organization called The Corridor. It's associated with the Business Improvement District up there in that area of town. And Cheryl Blue, the executive director, talks about the Garden Homes neighborhood, which is just north of Capitol Drive there, 
at one point being the most affluent black community in the world around that time when all those manufacturing jobs are there. You're talking about engineers and executives down to, you know, people that ran presses, but they're still really good manufacturing jobs. Uh, a lot of those left. And I think a lot of the, not a lot of the issues, but some of the issues come back to that. You know, you provide people a good job, you provide some better tax base, you provide some better education. There's a lot of things that go into, into it, but really what it means to restore that is, is to start the movement. I mean, I'm not going to see the end of it probably, but if we can start the momentum again, in the city of Milwaukee, investing in those areas. What I can do, I can't go and teach everybody in the world, but what I can do is I can talk to other business leaders and try to get them there to support those jobs, support the tax base, and hopefully better the education for those children, of the people that are working there. So let's say somebody listening to this podcast is a business executive, a CEO, or just somebody interested in helping you in this initiative. If they wanted to get involved, what could they do to support and how do they join you in this effort? Call me, email me, whatever they want. I used to offer, you know, if you want to talk to me about development at Century City, we, let's have a beer. That's tough these days <laughs> with people that you don't know, but we can have a Zoom beer or whatever. Basically, we're not in this to profit on our real estate investment. We want to see growth of businesses. So we've got a building, we're using about a third of it. We're marketing to small and medium-sized businesses that want to come in and share some space with us. It's really good manufacturing and warehousing space. Brand new building pretty much hasn't been used by anybody but us. If that's not a fit, the city is marketing, I think, an additional 56 or so acres of land for building. The incentives are phenomenal. They just really want to see this land developed. So give me a call. I can get you in touch with the right people that fit your project. If you're not looking to invest or, or move a business up there and want to get involved with the Business Improvement District, the Corridor, or any of the other nonprofit organizations that are kind of pushing this cause and others in the neighborhood, let me know. I can get you in touch with them too. What kind of momentum are you gaining with this initiative? What are some of the things that you're seeing out there that are giving you the confidence that, hey, we're onto something. Hey, this is working. Can you talk a little bit about some of the accomplishments and achievements that you've witnessed in this regard? Yeah. I mean, outside of business accomplishments and pats on the back, it's been a slow move. I'm involved at the business improvement district in the area, and we're currently working on housing project, you know, buying up foreclosed homes or, uh, you know, boarded up homes that the city you know, stops every, anyone from living in. And we're redeveloping those and hopefully providing them as a rent to own. Because one of the biggest issues in these neighborhoods is you know, stable housing. So if, if somebody has stable housing, they're more likely to be able to go out and look, out, look for a job because they're not looking for housing every day. So that's definitely an accomplishment. We've secured funding for that project and it looks like it's going to go forward. It is a long project. I think we're doing something like 40 homes. So It'll be slow. It'll take a little while, but but we're going to get there step by step with a lot of support from the community. We've had a couple of projects real close in the neighborhood coming th to come through, but kind of at the last moment they've fallen apart. Again, this pandemic doesn't really help. I'm hoping the social movement does because more eyes will be on this area, and hopefully more business owners will say, you know what, I need to put together a new project, and I want it to be here because I want to help that neighborhood. Yeah, one of my favorite questions to ask of successful individuals, and you're certainly in that category, is the question of what drives you. I'm fascinated by what motivates people, what inspires them, what gets them to be the best possible version of themselves on a daily basis. And when you were asked that question, you had said, a love for where I live, work, and play, and the fact that I get bored rather easily. Well, you and I are in good company there. So where does this love come from? Where does that drive come from? Have you always been that way since a child, or did you kind of notice this about yourself over time as you got older? Uh, it was probably over time. Not that I was ever particularly lazy, you know, played a lot of sports as a kid. But growing up in a family that is go, 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 get it done, that instills it in you. And then I think my wife does it as well. She's a hard worker also, but you know, we know how to sit back and have a good time too. Basically, I get up at the beginning of the day, I have a coffee and you know, if I don't have something to do, I find something to do. And 
I think that goes throughout a lot of our managers at Good City as well, is we've always got a new project that we're working on. And for me, I think that just comes with my upbringing. Describe to me a little bit the culture at Good City Brewing, because yours is a successful organization. You've got a lot of happy employees, and you guys are doing a lot of good things in your neck of the woods. Can you describe a little bit about your corporate culture and from your table where you're sitting here right now, can you talk about how that kind of came into fruition? Yeah, I think a lot of that goes back to our founders and, you know, when they started the company, one of the biggest pieces was making sure that uh, knowing where your place is and making sure your place is better and continues to get better is a key tenant. So these guys wanted a brewery in their neighborhood, so they started a brewery in their neighborhood. They want their neighborhood and their whole city to be better when we're done. And so we continue to do that. So we place a big premium on community engagement uh, at Good City through two programs. One is Seek the Good Saturday. Uh, So before the pandemic kind of rained on our parade, we had a program that uh, once a month on a Saturday, we would team up with a local nonprofit and bring our customers and employees together and do whatever project they want us to do. So we've done a lot of different projects, you know, most notably in my head, the one that I've done twice is cleaning book at books at next door foundation. They bring in, I think probably tens, if not hundreds of thousands of books every year, and they give them away to children that might not have access to books in their home. But what we have to do as volunteers before they give them away is clean the books. We make sure all names are removed. You know, you know, when you have books as a kid, your parents write, write your name in them right away so that they're not lost. So we remove the names, we clean them up, make them shiny, and then they're able to be distributed to the students. So we've done that. Typically, that's a winter project because you can do it inside. In the summer, we get outside. We've done a couple with Urban Ecology Center, cleaning up parks, removing invasive species from different parks in the area, cleaning up the river, stuff like that. The second program is called Drink for Good. Every month we team up with a different nonprofit and on Thursday nights we invite them in to set up a table, whatever they want to do, invite all their friends and family. We'll also invite people and then a dollar from every beer sold every Thursday goes to that organization. So we've been running those programs for a while. Again, Seek the Good Saturdays on hold for now since we can't bring people together We did try to do one virtually where people shared videos. It was semi-successful. People really like to come out and volunteer in person. And then we have them all back to the brewery for a beer and some snacks afterward on us. So that's another, you know, carrot that we put out there for them. So your organization, first and foremost, is a brewery, Good City Brewing, but you also have a restaurant component to your organization. How did that come about? Yeah, so the founders were, first and foremost, we were going to be a brewery. They knew they wanted to have a tap room because that's what all West Coast breweries had, a place where your customers can come in and drink at the source. At the time, Milwaukee didn't have many craft breweries and didn't have many tap rooms. I think at the time it was Lakefront, Milwaukee Brewing Company, and Sprecher. And then the summer that Good City opened, we had this explosion of of craft beer in Milwaukee, you know, with us and Third Space opening Renner was in the uh, Walker's Point, I think, at the time. Mobcraft moved to Milwaukee. You know, we had this huge influx in in, uh, in breweries. And we wanted to have a simple tap room and restaurant, maybe a sandwich stand. If you guys have ever been at Founders, you know, you walk up and order your sandwich. It's brought out to you later. Nothing too intricate. But when the founders, they listed a job on Craigslist and they got a response from this executive chef from Rumpus Room, who at the time was looking for a dishwasher on Craigslist, but saw this posting and thought, I could work at a brewery. So we ended up with Chef Guy Davies, who worked at Bartolotta for a long time, and really, you know, punched above kind of the the weight class that, that these guys were looking to go to at Good City. But, you know, we went from potentially being a sandwich stand and, and tap room where you can have a beer to full service restaurant with entrees, being able to execute events on site. Etc. You talk about an explosion of breweries. There's no shortage of competition in your space for sure. What would you say is the good city brewing differentiator? What makes your organization unique and different from the other breweries that are out there? I think some breweries in the country do what we do, you know, kind of where, where I think 
all the things that we do well, but there's very few in Milwaukee. I think first and foremost, it's obviously the beer. A lot of places make really good beer now though. You know, 10, 15 years ago, you go to a craft brewery in it, brewery or a pub, a, a brew pub, and you know, it's kind of hit, hit or miss if you're going to have some good beer. Ours is good. And now a lot of everybody else's beer is good too. So I think, you know, when you stack that with the level our culinary team has taken our menu to, that differentiates us, especially in the Milwaukee area, being a full service restaurant, having that level of care and dedication and the level of team that we have in the kitchen sets us apart. And then third, currently, it's hard to have big events right now, but third, we've actually done a really good job at hosting events all the way up to 350 person weddings down to a 20 person birthday dinner at the tap room. I think those two things outside of the beer, again, a lot of places make really good beer nowadays, the culinary team and their execution, and then the events have really set us apart. So for individuals listening to this that don't know much about your organization, from a physical footprint perspective, where are you located? And as a follow-up question, if somebody wants to book an event, wants to have a function in some of your facilities, how do they go about contacting you? Sure. So we started uh, the, the brewery and tap room is on the east side of Milwaukee, 2108 North Farwell Avenue. Uh, so that's the original location. A couple of years later, we opened downtown next to Fiserv Forum. So if you go down to the Deer District, if you can see the arena, you can probably see Good City. We've got a big old sign on this beautiful uh, glass structure. And that's where we host events as well. Uh, and then on the northwest side, uh, I call it the northwest side. It's probably just the north side to most people. 31st and Capital is our uh, warehouse and office. So that's where we have our corporate offices. We've got a big beer cooler that we can hold our finished goods inventory and all our packaging materials there. Actually, I'll step back to the downtown location and tell you a quick funny story of kind of how that came about. It was an, an open process. So it was a competitive process where several different breweries bid out to, to have this location in uh, the Deer District. And I think our team did a, did a great job um, putting together a bid and, and showing that we could do all these things that I've talked about, you know, with the culinary program, with events, et cetera. After we knew we were opening and we announced it publicly, we had a bunch of the people back to the brewery and Peter Fagan walked in. And Chef Guy Davies was standing next to me and he's like, oh, I've seen that guy before. I'm like, Guy, when, you know, of course, everybody's seen him. I'm like, everybody knows that guy is said, no, before we even opened, I was here setting up the kitchen and this guy was peeking in the windows. And, you know, I thought, whatever, I'll let him in. And I, I let him in and I showed him around and I, none of our beer was ready yet, but I, I took a little bit off the tank just so he could taste it. So he was like one of the first guys in here. I'm like, and you didn't even know who he was? No, no. I'm like, guy, you're the reason that we opened this place downtown. <laughs> anyway, as far as events, we're having a hard time executing them right now due to the pandemic, but you can certainly head to our website. We've got uh, several different locations to choose from there, all different sizes. We can host small groups at our East Side Tap Room, all the way up to larger events at our downtown venue. Well, I got to tell you, Kyle, all this talk about Good City Brewing is making me mighty thirsty. So I think we might have to stop here so I can quench that thirst. But on behalf of all of us at Beyond the Known, I thank you for coming to the studio here today, sharing your expertise and words of wisdom. We learned a lot, and we really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Paul. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Known with Paul M. Newberger. If you like our show and want to know more, check us out at stargroup.com. That's S-T-A-R-R-Group.com slash podcast. We're also available on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.